Good morning, greetings, friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I am your host, Pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I specialize in using nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your health and vitality and well-being, and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health issue. That is why we are here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 29 years of practicing pharmacy, I've seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes and hypertension and obesity and skin diseases like acne, psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, dry skin, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds. Recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle, but what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure because the human biological system is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And while some folks may call that healing and renewing system a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health or nutrition or prescription drugs, if you want to get off your medications or help a loved one get off their meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we are here for you. We want to help you change your life. We want to help you change the lives of loved ones, family members, workmates today. Call us, 844-236-6010, 844-236-6010. If you have questions about the Ingevity products, the Ingevity business, if you have a success story you'd like to share, or if you just want to contribute to our conversation, 844-236-6010 is our number today and every day on the bright side. If you want to sign up and make some money selling Ingevity products, if you want to join the Bright Side Ben team, help spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program, love to have you on my team. Please call the Bright Side Ben phone team at 866-735-2470. That's 866-735-2470. You can also head over to brightsideben.com, brightsideben.com, and check out our shopping cart, or you can click on the Join the Team link and sign up to join the Bright Side Ben team right off the website, brightsideben.com. Oh, you can also check out my blog, pharmacistben.com, which we update regularly with news stories as well as blog posts, pharmacistben.com, also criticalhealthnews.com. That's my blog that I'm doing with George Nori from Coast to Coast AM, criticalhealthnews.com, pharmacistben.com, or brightsideben.com. Okay, so we are talking skin health. We're talking about the skin. We're talking about the skin as representative of the entire body. The skin is a iconic structure in the body. We could easily use the bones or the muscles or the pancreas or the liver or any other organ in the body as representative, but because the skin turns over so fast and because we all love skin and skin care and skin health, it makes perfect sense for us to use the skin as an iconic structure to represent the entire body. I use the skin as a diagnostic tool to assess what my patients or what I'm doing right if my skin's breaking out, or if it's dry, or if it's rashy, or eczema, or psoriasis, something's wrong. As the eczema disappears, as the dry skin disappears, we're doing something right. And skin turns over so, because skin turns over so fast, we can use it as a kind of window to what's happening inside the body. I always look at the fingernails. When somebody comes in, somebody came into my pharmacy, or when I was helping somebody with their body, I would always look at the fingernails. The fingernails are an appendage of the skin. They're not technically the skin, but but they're considered to be an appendage of the skin, and the, the fingernails turn over even faster than other parts of the skin. So you can use the fingernails as an instant peek into what's happening inside the body. If you have spots on your fingernails, your fingernails are thinning. If you have any kind of fingernail problems, guaranteed, 100%, 100.00%, you're dealing with a deficiency or, or, or a digestive condition, a nutritional deficiency or a digestive condition if you've got something going on in your fingernails. Likewise with any part of the skin. Skin turns over super rapidly every four to eight weeks, four weeks when we're younger, eight weeks when we're older. And it also burns through nutrients very rapidly. And because to the body, the skin is not as relevant or is not as important as the internal structures of the uh, internal structures, the body will redirect nutrients in a deficiency state. If we're deficient in vitamin A or vitamin C or vitamin E, the body will redirect, it will reroute nutrients to the more significant parts of the body, the heart and the liver and the lungs, etc., and the brain, all the internal structures. That means that the skin is going to exhibit nutritional deficiencies super quickly. 
Now, we've been talking a lot of, uh, we spent a lot of time, and we'll continue to spend a lot of time talking about the skin's favorite vitamins, vitamins A and C. We'll also talk about some of the skin's favorite minerals here in a little bit. Both vitamin A and vitamin C are not just important for skin, they're important for overall protection and overall structure. Vitamin C is a connective tissue vitamin. A vast majority, or 30% or so, of the body is made up of connective tissue. And the most important connective tissue is called collagen. Vitamin C deficiency disease, scurvy, is a collagen disease. Collagen breaks down. Collagen makes up not just the, the, the structure or the scaffolding or the framework of our skin. It also makes up the structure or the scaffolding or the framework of our blood vessels and our bones. That means under vitamin C deficiency, you're going to be more prone towards aneurysms and strokes and, and problems with the circulatory system. Under conditions of vitamin C deficiency, you're going to be likely, you're going to, it's going to be likely that you're going to be dealing with bone weakness. Osteoporosis could very well be a type of scurvy. Vitamin C deficiency, like all nutritional deficiencies, occurs along a continuum. You can have major vitamin C deficiency or you can have minor vitamin C deficiency. Same with vitamin A. Vitamin A is actually a complex of vitamins. There's various forms of vitamin A. They're all called retinoids, and they're all involved in keeping the structure of the body strong. Vitamin A is a building vitamin. Vitamin A also plays an important role in helping the body handle energy, specifically sugar. There's a very important relationship between building stuff and sugar and sugar metabolism and cell growth. All of this is under the is in the uh, is in the purview of vitamin A. Vitamin A works with all of these elements with sugar metabolism. Actually, there was a couple of really neat articles. There was one article that came out. I'm just reading it. Where the heck did I put this thing? Uh, it's on vitamin A deficiency and. Uh, and diabetes, as it turns out, I don't know where I have this article. I'm just going to read it to you. All right, here you go. Role of vitamin A in type 2 diabetes biology effects of intervention therapy in a deficient state. This is from uh, the journal Nutrition. just came out last week. And apparently, vitamin A is involved in, uh, vitamin A deficiency is involved in the development of diabetes. That's very understandable because vitamin A is a growth vitamin. And you need to have sugar and you need to have energy for cells to grow. Vitamin A... Uh, is required for the smooth and even division of cells because skin cells are growing so fast vitamin a plays a major role in the health of the skin vitamin a is important for cell growth everywhere in the body vitamin a is actually used as chemotherapy for treating lung cancer for this very reason vitamin a helps stabilize energy it helps cells grow Interesting, uh, two of the most significant health issues that we deal with, obesity and blood sugar control, are associated with retinoids, associated with vitamin A and vitamin A deficiency. And of course, when it comes to skin, vitamin A is a go-to vitamin for pretty much every single skin issue you can name, from acne to dry skin to dark spots to accelerated skin aging and wrinkles and fine lines. That's taken orally as well as using topically. Now, before you go out and start dosing yourself with vitamin A, and I do recommend vitamin A supplements for folks, 20,000 IU a day of vitamin A. Before you go out and start dosing yourself, though, with vitamin A, it's important to recognize that absorption of vitamin A plays a key role in making sure that you're going to be able to take advantage of your vitamin A. Vitamin A is a fatty vitamin. That means you've got to have a healthy intestine, gallbladder, liver, pancreas. You've got to be making enough stomach acid. All of these structures, all of these systems in the body have to be operating and firing on all cylinders if you're going to be able to absorb your vitamin A. Just, I just uh, finished up a video with Amanda Rideout, health coach, on fat absorption and various supplements that you could use to improve fat absorption. So you're going to want to check that out if you're on our YouTube channel. If you're not, send me an email, ben at ksco.com, and we'll set you up. It's important to take vitamin A. It's probably helpful to take vitamin A with your meals, especially enzyme-rich meals, especially vegetables, which contain lots of enzymes, or even just to take some ultimate enzymes with your meals and with vitamin A supplements. Use some apple cider vinegar. That will increase stomach acid as well. I personally like starting off all my meals with stomach bitters, with bitter vegetables, parsley, arugula, radishes, kale. Bitter greens and bitter vegetables have a really interesting role to play when it comes to vitamin A absorption, when it comes to all nutrient absorption, and when it comes to feeling full and satisfied after your meals. Hang tight. We'll tell you what I mean. I'll tell you what I mean when we come back from our break. 844-236-6010 is our number. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. We'll be back right after this. back 
on the Bright Side. I am Pharmacist Ben. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific, 10 to 11 at Central Time. Got a lot of archives at brightsideben.com, also benfuchsarchives.com. Thank you to Peter in the UK for setting that up. If you want to purchase any of the Longevity products you hear advertised on the program, please call the Bright Side Ben phone team at 866-735-2470. And if you want to start yourself a nutritional supplement business, they can help you do that as well for a one-time $25 fee, 866-735-2470 is their number. You can also sign up right off my website, brightsideben.com. Okay, so we're talking uh, vitamin A and skin health. Vitamin A absorption, of course, is just as important as taking vitamin A. Nutrient absorption is just as important as nutrient intake. One of the best ways to increase the absorption of vitamin A and other nutrients from foods is to start off all your meals with bitters, bitter greens. I personally like parsley. Chewing on a little bit of parsley to start your meals can stimulate digestive juices, arugula, radish, kale. Bitter greens are nutritional powerhouses on their own. They're loaded with vitamin A, or vitamin A-like substances, I should say. Vitamin A is an animal vitamin. You're only going to find it in animal products. But retinoids and carotenes, which are similar to vitamin A, can be found in vegetables like bitter greens. Vitamin C is in parsley and other bitter greens. You know, a little vitamin K probably too. And you'll also get lots of wonderful sun protection nutrients from your bitter greens. And they'll help you, uh, they'll help turn on digestive juices as well. There's five main tastes. You got sweet, you got salty, you got sour, you got bitter, and you also have a taste called umami. A lot of folks haven't heard of umami. Umami is savory, meaty, Chicken soup has a umami kind of flavor. Bitter is the one most of us despise. The reason why people don't like bitter flavors typically is because throughout our evolutionary history, bitter flavor was associated with poisons. Bitter flavor told us when we ate, tasted something that was bitter, we told us that it was a poisonous plant of some kind. So there's a fine line, of course, between poison and medicine. And that little hit of bitter that we get from parsley or radishes or arugula can be therapeutic, at least in terms of the digestive system. you also find yourself eating less food if you start your meals off with a little arugula or dandelion root or something bitter. You'll find that you're filler or fuller faster if you start your meals off with some digestive juice stimulating bitters. And of course, you'll also be absorbing your fatty nutrients more effectively because you'll be stimulating the secretion of bile. And vitamin A absorption will be increased when you start off your meals with a little bit of bitters. Vitamin A is also important. We talk about vitamin A for building things, for building the skin. Well, vitamin A is also important for skin moisturization. If you have dry skin, you have uh, any other skin care issue, you have an internal problem. Very likely you have a digestive problem and a food problem. Even if it looks like your skin care issue is a topical problem, the likelihood that you're just dealing with a skin problem is very, very slim. It's almost impossible just to have a skin problem. Yeah, you can, you can have some kind of contact issue if you touch something, maybe like an allergic reaction or concrete dermatitis that construction workers get. You can actually even have a gluten reaction topically. Bakers will sometimes get gluten reactions from working with flour. But this is rare for the most part. The vast majority of times, if you're dealing with something on the skin, you're dealing with something internal. Now, dry skin is a very, very common problem, and nothing exemplifies or demonstrates how unhealthy we are as a culture than the fact that everybody seems to have dry skin. Almost 100% of adults seem to have dry skin. The dry skin market, the moisturizer market, I should say, is a, a $13 billion market. Do you know that the vast majority, 25 or 26, I think it was, I think I says 26 percent of uh, skincare, uh, the skincare marketplace is driven by four main moisturizer products. The first one is Neutrogena, then Aveeno. There's another company called Rock. I consider Rock to be one of the most sneakiest, nastiest of all the skincare companies. Lies everywhere in their marketing and their advertising. At least Neutrogena and Aveeno are more honest. In any case, Rock. Clean and Clear, Aveeno, Neutrogena. Last week we spoke about Eucerin. There's Gold Bond, Cetaphil, Olay. Lots of all these different moisturizers. Why do we have so many darn moisturizers? They're all basically the same thing. Whether it's Cetaphil or Aveeno or Olay or whatever, they're all basically wax and oil and preservative and fragrance, and that's about it. The, the, the whole idea of moisturizing your skin, this old school notion of moisturizing your skin by coating it with something, 
Where does this come from? Now, yeah, you know, you might create some kind of, uh, you might get some relief if your skin is super duper dry and you put some oil or wax on top, but you're not going to create any changes. Good news is you're not going to spend a lot of money. Most moisturizers are pretty cheap. You only have to fork out about 10 bucks or so to get most moisturizers. But the bad news is you're not going to do anything except cover your skin up with wax and oil, suffocate your skin, suppress your skin's chemistry. Would you ever rub a cream or an oil on any other organ of your body? Why is it that we do it so routinely with the skin? Why is it that our dermatologists and our skincare professionals recommend that we smear the stuff all over their skin? Probably because our dermatologists and unfortunately a lot of our skincare professionals don't really understand the skin. If you've been listening to this program now for the last month or so or maybe two months that we've been talking about skin, you know a heck of a lot more about how to take care of your skin than your dermatologist does. That's not saying much, but... We've covered all kinds of stuff here about how to take care of acne and how to take care of moisture, uh, uh, dry skin, how to take care of, uh, uh, of dark spots. We've covered all kinds of stuff. You, you can basically get a degree in skincare just from listening to this program for the last couple of months. Go back and check out the archives and then start yourself a skincare business. So last week we spoke about Eucerin. We said it's 100%, 100% water, wax, filler, preservative, nothing else. Unless you consider mineral oil to be active, you don't have any active ingredients in your eucerin. This is scandalous. This is insulting. It's offensive. It's greedy. This corporate strategy of, of selling us wax and oil and telling us we've we're moisturized our skin exploits our tendency to confuse the product with our skin. You rub your finger on your skin, you feel product, and we think it's skin. Eucerin is the go-to moisturizing product for medical professionals and dermatologists. And we went over the ingredient deck last week. Check out the archives at brightsideben.com. We broke it down. And there was nothing in it except for wax and oil and water and preservative and a little mineral oil. Chemical peels. We haven't talked about chemical peels. Glycolic acid peels, lactic acid peels. That's a great way to stimulate collagen production, to stimulate uh, moisture factor production, to create new soft, soft tissue to eliminate dark spots. Chemical peels can be very, very helpful. A lot of folks are intimidated by chemical peels, and it's understandable given the term peels. I like to think of chemical peels as rapid exfoliation. Exfoliation is the shedding of surface cells. It turns everything on. It's like an exercise for the skin. And there's lots of things you could do uh, to make the skin look healthier, to make, your, to make your skin healthier, not just to look healthier, but to make your skin healthier by applying glycolic acid, acetic acid, lactic acid. These are technically called alpha hydroxy acids on your skin. If you don't want to go uh, to an esthetician, I recommend people go to estheticians once a month or so to have a skin peel, especially as you're getting older. But if you don't want to go, just do your own peel at home. You can do a mild peel with some red wine or, or vinegar. You can go get some lactic acid or glycolic acid from a pharmacy, get a 10 or 15%, have it uh, neutralized down to a pH of about 3-ish or so, and you can do your own skin peels at home. I still hear, I, I still hear uh, unsophisticated dermatologists and, and even skincare professionals and clients saying they don't like peels, they don't like exfoliation. There's, a, there's actually, a, well, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll talk about chemical peels tomorrow. I want to talk about something called hyaluronic acid tomorrow. And then we'll talk about a very important protein that's involved with eczema and psoriasis and dry skin as well. We'll do all that as we continue talking skin health on the... All right, we are back on the bright side. I'm pharmacist Ben. Tomorrow we'll talk about... Uh, Hyaluronic acids. A lot of folks have heard of hyaluronic acid if they've uh, dabbled even a little bit in the in the world of skin care. But hyaluronic acid is a little misunderstood when it comes to taking care of their skin. Certainly, there's hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is how you say that in the skin, and it's got a very important role to play in terms of moisturization. But it's not. Uh, it's not. You can't just put the stuff right on your skin and expect to get the benefits. And I hear a lot of folks telling me or asking me about hyaluronic acid in skin care. And uh, you can't, as important as it is, you can't just smear the stuff on the surface of the skin and expect to get the results. We'll talk about that tomorrow as we continue talking skin health on the bright side. 844-236-6010 is our number. 844-236-6010. Time to hit the phones. Jeanette in Texas. What's going on? Welcome to the bright side. Good morning. Thank you for your time. I, hey, I what's up? It. Sure. Um, I've been a diabetic for quite a while. Okay. But the background on me, I've had polio. I've had cancer. You had polio? Diabetic. Did you say polio? P 
polio. I had polio at two and a half years old. Wow. That was in 49. Uh-huh. Okay. And I've and gone through cancer. Oh, my goodness. You're a survivor. And I'm also diabetic. Look at this. You're a survivor, Jeanette. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> yeah, oh, my yeah. God. Nothing's That's getting you down. I believe it. How, uh, can I ask you, Are you, in your, you must be in the 70s, I guess? How old? 70? Not quite 70s. I'm 68. 68, okay. All right, here's the uh -huh. deal. But, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I would like to do is get off the insulin. When I was okay. in, I'm a nationally certified colon hydrotherapist. Oh, nice. And I've also had 25 years of restoration work. I restore photographs. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. I was very, very healthy at that time, keeping control of the diabetes. Then they decided to put me on insulin, <sighs> and all it did for me was to bloat me. Well, it probably, did, it probably did a lot of other bad things, too. Insulin is very pro-aging stuff, and it will make you gain weight. Yes. And It's not a pleasant, it's yes. not, you, know, you need insulin, obviously. Here's the deal with insulin. When your body loses okay. sense, over the course of time, as we eat lots of insulin-spiking foods, foods that cause insulin secretion or stimulate insulin, insulin uh -huh. secretion from the pancreas, eventually cells stop listening to insulin. You know, there's a dumbing uh -huh. down or, or a dampening effect that occurs when something happens over and over and over again. You ever... Uh, you know, if you hear loud music or something, eventually it, it doesn't sound loud as loud over time because the body kind of turns down the volume on things. And this is one uh -huh. of the ways the body handles stuff. And that's, it, it happens in terms of chemistry in the body and it happens in terms of insulin. That's called insulin resistance. All right. Insulin resistance is when cells stop listening to insulin. Under ordinary circumstances, you eat a you eat a sweet food, a sugary food. Uh, the uh, pancreas, which, by the way, has its own taste taste buds, taste bud like cells. The insulin senses elevations in sugar and it will uh, secrete insulin into the blood. And then the insulin acts on the cells to cause cells to suck up the the sugar, the glucose from the blood. But over the course of time, as this happens over and over and over again, the pancreas is like, forget it. We were just out last time, last hour. We were just out uh, 10 minutes ago. We're not going to go, we're not going to bother anymore. And eventually yeah. cells stop listening to insulin. The pancreas doesn't support, it doesn't secrete as much insulin. Actually, what happens is the cells stop listening to insulin. The pancreas keeps pumping out insulin, and cells stop listening, and the pancreas pumps out more. Eventually, insulin doesn't work as well. So what the doctors do, the medical model does, is it sticks more insulin in the body to force the cells to listen oh. to insulin. It's like, you're not going to listen to the body's insulin. Well, we're going to pump you up with even more insulin. Eventually, you're going to start listening. Now, obviously, what ends up happening is the cells stop listening to that insulin that you stuck in your blood, yeah. and, and then you need more, and you keep needing more. This is the stupidity, oh. the utter stupidity of the medical model. And while I have a lot of friends who are doctors, I find it very hard to defend them when they have these kinds of strategies. Cells stop listening to insulin, so what do you do? You give it more. Cells stop listening to that amount of insulin, so what do you do? You give it more, and you give it more, and you give it more, forgetting the fact that insulin's pro-aging. It'll make you gain weight. It'll make cells divide really rapidly. It'll increase your risks of cancer. And by the way, if you have a history of cancer, what kind of boneheaded doctor would stick more insulin in the body uh, to somebody who already has a history of cancer? All right, long story short, how do you get off insulin? How do you reduce your intake of insulin? Well, Jeanette, you know the answer to this question. You know the answer. Answer, okay. Do you take? When do you take your insulin? What do you? What did you do right before you injected yourself with insulin? When? When are you supposed to use your I insulin? Take my sugar first. You first. You have a meal, right? And, and then you have a meal. And, 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 yeah, and yeah. Okay. That's when you have and your insulin. I, I'm, I'm, well, hang on. I'm. I'm uh -huh. work with. Listen. Listen up here. I want you to work with me. Okay. So you you take okay. your insulin after you have a meal, right? So when are you not right. taking insulin? When you're not having a meal, right? That's so you, right. Okay. So you answered your own question. How do you That's reduce? It. You stop eating. <laughs> That's how you get off well, insulin. Did you know that is true. I know because it's true. I, it, I was ninety-three pounds, and what I would do would be nibbling throughout the day. Well, you and don't no have insulin. Well, you know, because you, no. you haven't reached the threshold. But the point is, is when you reduce your intake of food, you'll be able to reduce your insulin. And when you especially reduce your intake of fast-burning sugars, you'll be able to reduce your insulin. Mm -hmm. Now, insulin is required for the metabolism of protein as well as sugar. So you're going to have to reduce uh -huh. all your intake of calories and reduce your intake of food. 
Interestingly, only fat doesn't spike insulin. Carbs will spike insulin, protein a little bit too. So coconut oil, for example, that can be very satisfying and it's not going to have an effect on your insulin. A, a dramatic, it might have a little bit, but not a, not a significant effect on your insulin. So use coconut oil in the middle of the day. Apple cider vinegar also can help support insulin. And of course, there's wonderful nutritional supplements that can uh, support insulin. Now, all your meals should end with apple cider vinegar, Jeanette, and everybody really. All your, and, and by the way, if you begin your meals with apple cider vinegar, you're going to find your eating less food. Stomach bitters can also, we talked about stomach bitters earlier, mm. that, that can also help support insulin. So stomach bitters, eating less food, coconut oil, apple cider vinegar, and then the, uh, don't forget about wonderful nutritional supplements that can be used to strengthen, potentize insulin, make your insulin more potent so you don't need as much. And uh, uh -huh. uh, the, the Sweeties is, is stupendous for that. Vanadium and chromium are two of the most important nutrients for potentizing insulin. And all the B-complex is very important for potentizing insulin, especially thiamine, vitamin B1, and niacin. Now, Jeanette, if you're 68 years old, you're probably going to be deficient in vitamin B12. You might want to get some vitamin B12 shots. That will also help you uh, help support insulin. And then there's great minerals that can strengthen insulin as well. Uh, magnesium, super duper important for strengthening insulin. And so is selenium. MSM sulfur may help. And we talked about vitamin A earlier, how vitamin A and diabetes are connected. Vitamin A can help support insulin. 20,000 IU of vitamin A. Make sure you take it with your digestive enzymes and your stomach bitters to make sure you're absorbing your vitamin A. I also like alpha lipoic acid for helping strengthen insulin. Also, uh, vitamin C can help strengthen insulin. Get on the Healthy Star Pack. Get on the Sweeties. Use apple cider vinegar. You might want to throw in some of the Fucoid Z or the Z radical. That can help. And eat less food, and you'll need less insulin. How's that? Good. Good deal, Wonderful. Jeanette. God bless you. Good luck with okay. everything. Thanks for your call. Appreciate it. Okay. Let's uh, move on to Harold in California. What's up, Harold? Welcome to the Bright Side. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. I, I appreciate you for the last 15 years. And, 15 and, uh, years yeah. since I was a little kid? Yeah, Ben. No, when you first <laughs> showed up to help Dr. Wallach. Oh, good. That, yeah, that was, not, you know what? That's almost, that, you know? that's a long time ago. Are you in, are you in Northern California? Are you in Santa Cruz, Harold? Y yes, sir. Yes, sir. In, uh, Monterey. Or Selena, Monterey. Sir. Have we met? Have you and I met? Yes, we have. Okay, so hang tight. I'll, we'll get to you when we come back from our break, okay. Harold. And I'm going to be in Santa Cruz in a couple weeks. Hopefully, we'll get to see you. I'll be in uh, Sacramento and Santa Cruz. And uh, don't go away, Harold. We'll get to you when we come back from our break. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. We'll be back right after this. are back on the bright side talking to Harold in California. Our number is 844-236-6010 and we do have a couple lines open for you. Harold, what's going on, my friend? How can we oh, help you? I, I have a brother in the Lord that's about 88 and uh, six months ago he told me that he didn't have any taste or smell. Oh, and, okay. And uh, I then was shocked to find six months later he's still not and he's deeply into AMA and VA care uh, with okay. their friends and nobody's fixed Humpty Dumpty. So, <laughs> Okay, well, he's definitely got some problems here. Uh, that's the least of his issues. That's the tip of the iceberg, no taste and smell. Could be a couple things. First of all, zinc deficiency will cause a lack of taste and smell, and zinc deficiency is extremely common, and everybody needs zinc. Zinc's a major building, anti-aging, skin health, immunity, uh, pro-immunity, anti-cancer vitamin. 50 milligrams a day of zinc picolinate. Get them on it right away. Okay. Uh, always, always balance out your zinc with copper. Uh, so have him take two to four milligrams of a copper uh, chelate with his zinc picolinate. And zinc picolinate is the preferred form of zinc. P i c o l i n a t e. Picolinate, as opposed to a cheapo zinc sulfate or zinc gluconate. Uh, so zinc picolinate, 50 milligrams a day. And then uh, with his copper. Uh, another thing that uh, impacts taste and smell is inflammation in the respiratory tract and the sinuses. Uh, in order for us to taste and to smell, a big part of taste is smell. If you're clogged up in your sinuses, you're not going to be smelling, you're not going to be tasting, and that's a very, a very good possibility that's what's happening. When I say it's a tip of the iceberg, Harold, that means there's other stuff going on in his body, and that's really what you want to focus on. You can't just focus on taste and smell any more than you can focus on uh, the leaves of a tree if the, the leaves are fungal or, or rotting with fungus. 
If the leaves are rotting, you're not going to fix them by spraying something on the leaves. That's done. You got to work on the roots and you got to work on the trees. Likewise with taste and smell. You can't work on taste and smell directly if there's other stuff going on in the body. If he's 88 years old and he's a standard American, normal person, he's got to have other things going on. I always want to, I, whenever I hear about lack of taste or smell, I think of inflammation, uh, uh, mucus or, or respiratory or sinus secretions clogging things up in the in the head. Uh, you know how when you when you have a cold or a sinus infection or you're stuffed up, you can't taste and you can't smell. You know what right. I'm talking about? Sure. It's the same. It's the same idea. So if he has a history of food allergies, chances are pretty good that he does a history of food intolerances that can cause that problem. So he's going to want to work on the digestive system and you know standard stuff we always talk about: food diary, eliminating problem foods, eating less food, using the biolumin nightly essence, digestive enzymes with all of his meals, apple cider vinegar with all his meals, etc. If he has arthritis or an inflammatory disease or, or allergies, those are really that's really good news because then he can start working with his inflammatory issues and he'll notice that his taste and his smell improve. I, if he, uh, does that make sense? Uh, yes, I didn't notice him, him having any, uh, we were kind of working together on a project and I didn't notice him have any um, and congestive or sneezing or you didn't American. notice you didn't no, I did not I did not okay well he may it may be subtle it may be under the radar ask him if he has any other inflammatory issues or food intolerances or food allergies that's what I'd be focusing on uh -huh. so zinc zinc and copper those are involved in taste uh, or zinc is involved in taste and then uh, the inflammatory component and the allergy component is what I'd be focusing on if he uh, if I'm he does have other issues that's good because then he can work on those and his taste and his smell will improve I'm sorry go uh, ahead I didn't I didn't get the the, the copper volume two to four milligrams two to four uh -huh. a day of a copper chelate along with 50 milligrams of zinc of course the healthy star pack that goes without saying and we talked about vitamin a earlier vitamin a and zinc work together as well the whole the whole uh, spectrum of nutrition through the healthy star pack and the mighty 90 nutrients but throw in some extra zinc and throw in some extra copper and vitamin uh, vitamin a as well uh, you, okay. I called Friday, and I, I'd heard that you were ta talking about Biolumin Nightly Essence. Oh, Night yeah, we had the guy, we had the formulator of the Biolumin Nightly Essence on the Wait. air. Sounded like that would be a key helper for him. Absolutely. Sure. Everybody needs that product. And I, I, I'm, I love the Biolumin Nightly Essence. I use it every day myself. I recommend it highly uh, for all digestive issues and also for your brother-in-law. Got to move on, Harold. Oh, yeah, Thank you no, so no, much. No, no, brother in the Lord. <laughs> Jesus. What's Thank that? you so much. Oh, your brother in the Lord. Thank, Thank you, you, my friend. Kind. Take, take care. Okay. All right. David in Texas. Good morning. Welcome to the Bright Side. <laughs> David. Hey, David, you got to turn your radio off, David. I think we lost David. All right. I don't know where David went. We're, David, you there? I am here. Okay. What's up, my friend? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing fairly good. Thank you. I, I appreciate you taking my call. I see sure. you uh, quite regularly here in Austin on Texas Liberty Radio. Awesome. And, Thank uh, you. Say hi to Deb yeah, Stevens. I've got a, I've got a question um, regarding a, a uh, illness I was diagnosed with recently. It's called a okay. Graves disease. Okay. A, uh, autoimmune disease. I'm sure you're aware of it. I'm aware of it. Uh, thyroid disease. Graves disease is very common or relatively common. Um, and the th thyroid disease in general is common. It's part of what I call the triangle of disease. Once the thyroid gets messed up, that's when everything else that's when everything else starts to starts to uh, break down in the body. The thyroid regulates the activity of every one of the 100 trillion cells in your body. Every one of the cells in your body depends on thyroid hormone for its activity. Now, hypothyroidism, poorly functioning thyroid, low functioning thyroid, is more common than Graves' disease, which is hyperthyroidism. But either way, you're dealing with an autoimmune problem. That means you're dealing with a food problem. Now, I said the triangle of disease. I haven't talked about that for a little bit, but there's three main points where the body breaks down, and then after that, everything else comes. Everything else follows. So the digestive system is the first point on the triangle of disease. That begins to break down way early, pretty much as soon as we're born or even in the womb, uh, certainly by the age of two or three for most of us if we're subsisting on the standard American diet. Uh, our digestive system starts to break down. Once that happens, it's a quick jump to the blood sugar or to dysglycemia, messed up blood sugar, and that's the second point on the triangle of disease. And then from uh, messed up blood sugar or dysglycemia, messed up blood sugar, dys means messed up, and glycemia, blood sugar. From digestive breakdown to dysglycemia, it's a quick jump to the thyroid. So you got that's the triangle digestive 
blood sugar, thyroid. If you have an autoimmune disease, and most thyroid problems are, have some component of autoimmunity, guarantee, David, you have a digestive problem. The immune system is synonymous with the digestive system for the most part. There is some immunity in the skin and a few other places in the blood, but for the most part, digestion is a synonym for immunity. Digestion equals immunity. That means, my friend, guaranteed, I'm not psychic. I'm just giving you how the body works here. I'm, I'm not psychic, Ben, I'm pharmacist, Ben. I'm telling you, you got a digestive health condition, right, David? Do you know about it? Or do I, you... I, believe, I, I think you're probably correct. You know, I have been uh, addressing it with uh with probiotics and some uh, enzymes. I was well, wanting to not know successfully, really. not successfully addressing it, although you may be doing some good uh, with the probiotics, which I recommend, and the enzymes. But you got to figure out what you're reacting to. And the only way to do that is, number one, to see when, you're, when your thyroid gets all, gets all jumpy, when you get hyperthyroid. Do you have blood pressure issues and sweating and all that kind of stuff and, and uh, okay. jitteriness? Every Anx- you can, everything. You can okay. Disease. Okay. Yeah, every Notice every when... Hands, but- all of that's all hyperthyroidism and, and don't let them drug your thyroid or take out your thyroid or radiate your thyroid that's the way the well, doctors well, treat it to, to do. uh, well you, you tell them it, yeah it on, uh, uh, all, uh, yeah uh, to kill the thyroid tap is yeah right so they this is the this is the stupidity of the model now again I don't want to blame individual doctors, although it's hard for me to understand how a human being can do this to another human being. But other than that, it's not an individual doctor problem. It is a model problem, a paradigm problem. The model says your thyroid is moving too fast. Let's poison it. The model says, the medical model says the thyroid is moving too fast. Let's radiate it or take it out. Oh, my God, I've seen people without a thyroid. I cannot even begin to tell you how heartbreaking that is to see somebody without a thyroid because some doctor took it out because somebody was hyperthyroid. The hyperthyroidism and autoimmunity mean focus on foods. Now, when you get worse, when you have uh, the jitteriness or the anxiety or the uncomfortable feeling, when it flares up, think about what you ate or, or pay attention to what you ate an hour or half an hour before. Usually it doesn't take very long for the thyroid to respond to a food. You'll find that there are foods that make the problem worse, and those are foods you need to eliminate. Do a food diary. Stay on the probiotics, the bioluminately essence, stay on the digestive enzymes, but it's extremely important that you do a food diary to see where your problems are, where your problem, what your problem foods are. Uh, the, the next thing right. to do is to stabilize the blood sugar. How do you stabilize the blood sugar? You don't eat you don't eat sugar. You don't eat bread. You don't eat pasta. You don't eat spaghetti. You don't eat rice. You don't eat anything that spikes up your blood sugar. Fruit juices and desserts. Get on the sweeties. Get on the healthy start pack. Throw in some Z radical and all the things we just talked about with our last caller for sugar support. And then the last step, and it's a very important step, is to calm the body down by activating the so-called parasympathetic nervous system. Deep breathing techniques. Every time you feel like your thyroid is going crazy, sit on the couch and slow deep breathing making sure you're focusing on the exhale that's where your body relaxes hot showers hot baths massage reiki yoga meditation all these are great ways to slow the body down hope we helped you david got to move on uh we're just flat out out of time if we left you on hold i apologize i'm pharmacist ben you're listening to the bright side you've been listening to the bright side we'll be back tomorrow with more good health information have a wonderful awesome spectacular day bye for now 